Sonata number 15, the Pastoral, opus 28 in D major. For me, there's a kind of line stretching from sonata number 12 through sonata number 13, the beginning, and even though the key is completely different, the beginning of number 15. In all of these, Beethoven is exploring some kind of emotion which is very nuanced. It is gentle but not just gentle, it is deep but not just deep, and it feels extremely alive and genuine and connected with something real that we have all experienced. And in a way I feel a progression in these three sonatas from the opening of number 12, which is still a little bit stylized. It is a mixture of really genuine touching emotion with still slightly something formal perhaps. Then a magical dreamy landscape in number 13, but here I feel in the pastoral that Beethoven finally found a direct access to some kind of life force and he was able to encapsulate it in notes and present to us the listeners. This is not to say that all these sonatas are um, about the same subject matter, but there is some common musical DNA between these three, and of course they were written around the same time period, 1801-1802. But the name Pastoral very aptly stuck, of course, to number 15. The nickname was not given by Beethoven himself, but rather by the publisher of the first English edition, slightly later, in 1804-1805. But I don't think anyone would dispute the pastoralness of this music, the beginning of the first movement and also the finale. The idea of a drone bass or the musette or bagpipes in the finale. These were common devices used to depict nature to signal in the music that it will be about something pastoral. But this is not just music depicting nature. In a way, it is less pastoral than the pastoral symphony, where we know exactly what Beethoven was trying to depict in the music he himself gave um, subtitles or titles to the movements. Here, for me, it is much more about the wonder of life, the miracle of life, the first moments that life comes um, out, the creation. There is this openness, hushed expectation in the music. By the way, something to note, which I only realized recently, that the harmonic progression very close to a composition by Mozart. Which of course progresses into different directions, but both of them I think have in common that they give us a wonderful feeling of ah. It opens with a very unusual chord, the same with the Mozart. Is this chord, which is a chord for a cadence, it is the chord for getting towards the end, but when it is employed here at the very beginning, it acquires almost a magical power of wonder and um, wonderment and hushed expectation. Also note, uh, in both the Mozart and the Beethoven, no chromatic harmonies, everything is diatonic. And he repeats it. He covers uh, 
a quite a big chunk of the keyboard and yet it is just feel for it is just still the first phrase the entire uh, first movement will be very broad and this broadness of in the sense that he is not hurried he is not trying to get us out of the home key as quickly as possible which is the usual case for sonatas we start somewhere and then we immediately need to move into the key of the dominant because this is how sonatas function. Whereas here, it takes a, a whole page and a half for him to move from that initial harmony. This contributes once again to this sense of, as I mentioned already, hushed expectation. Still all in the same harmony and still the same pulsation weaving in and out of the music like the promise of the, the eternal life, not perhaps an eternal life for a single person or a single being, but the eternity of life itself. Even then, when he begins finally moving from the home key, still everything is quite um, calm and serene. There's not a lot of drama, especially not in the exposition. No. And so it goes. And finally, when we get to what will become eventually the second subject, here instead of a pulsation of quarter notes, we get like a flowing, um, merry bubbling of brooks, of quavers. we come through a canyon and the horizon opens. This music, like almost everything which Beethoven wrote, is full of sforzandi. Sforzandi being strong accents which Beethoven usually employs on weak notes, so not on the downbeat but here it's a music in three, so on the second and third note. For example, here. But whereas in other places in Beethoven, these forzanti can be quite sharp. They can be sometimes humorous, they can be sometimes dramatic. Here I feel they're broad, it's more like leaning into the upbeat uh, rather than um, playing it sharply. So here. Credential chord. This abundance of life. And again. One thing to note about interpretation. When music is so suffused with a single kind of pulse, so we have this from the beginning. And then later we have this. It is really important to keep the pulsation as steady as possible, so as little rubato as we can, because the magic, the hypnotizing power of this pulsation is in its steadiness, a kind of like a heartbeat that might be slightly faster, slightly slower, but um, generally will be all the same. Um, and uh, the end of the exposition, so once again these rich, uh, abundant passages. Here, here's an interesting thing uh, rhythmically. If you listen to this music, I 
I imagine you heard this as one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Whereas it's actually it's three, one, three, one, three, one. It's a kind of sound illusion. If you know the visual illusion where you see a 3D box and you can switch it in your mind which part is the back and which part is the front. So it's the same thing. If we don't have any context, it could be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, or it could be. Now, because he has written it like this, three, one, two, three, one, two, I would say that we should try and play it like that. And the only way to do it is to make sure that the gap between the previous section and this one is extremely precise. So here how it ends. If we wait a little bit longer and then that is we will get one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. If you want to have it correctly. So to make sure that this one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three is extremely precise. And we could even give a small accent on the downbeat. It's only here that we really have downbeat. And after a repeat of this section, music descends into the depths and we repeat the exposition or the second time we go on this is quite ominous this is a little bit even menacing because we don't know what kind of harmony he will build on this unexpected f sharp but it's nothing more scary than a dominant chord to G major. But this moment of uncertainty is quite powerful. Also these empty octaves. The development is the only place in the first movement where we do have a little bit of drama. It is all based on the opening motif. So first he repeats it in full, but then the entire of the development will be using just the last bit of the motif. Or in minor, as the case may, may be it. Then in the left hand, as always with Beethoven, once he get, gets obsessed about a motive, he just keeps working and reworking it. And we'll see just in a second what he does with it later. But here, surrounding these, there are quite quick flowing passages in quavers. And if I mentioned before, there is not a lot of chromaticism. Well, here we have quite dense chromatic lines. This is quite strong. This you hear really, really dissonant. And now we get a dialogue first in the upper, then in the tenor. And now he takes just these notes and repeats them again and again and again. And he's 
got to this harmony. Listen how how intense and obsessed he is. And now just continuing again, not even not even four notes, but just. So it, it's a, it is as if he has taken the opening mode. If he played it in full, then he took just the last five notes, then he took just the last three notes, uh, sorry, four notes, and then now we have just the last three notes with gaps, but all on one harmony. <laughs> from here it's quite remarkable half a page of just repeating this chord with this motif going up and down left and goes down right and goes up and vice versa the image which I have in my mind is that after the storm the waters are gradually calming and we have suffered such an intense dramatic shock in these passages that we need also a little while to calm down. It is almost, almost impressionistic. So I think here it is almost okay to have a little bit less clarity in every note, not to, not to play it so. But slightly to smudge the colors. with a little bit of pedal covering it, as if to create more of an atmosphere rather than the precise contours of the notes. And then it descends, still on the same harmony. And finally we know where we're going. So out of this, it becomes a dominant chord. Of B major. He stops and goes to minor. He stops and then there are two bars which are magical. Pianissimo and Adagio. There is such... After all this drama, this is so comforting. This is like the opening of a new door when we thought hope perhaps has gone, but this is him saying, no, it's, it's all going to be fine. And from here he goes to the reprise. Utterly beautiful. The reprise is repeated in full, even with a little bit of um, extra passage work in the climaxes. But then at the end we have a coda, which will have the repeat of the opening motif, like a memory from afar. build the coda from the last part. What this final build-up means, perhaps an insistence that life after all uh, does have also power and strength and not just calm beauty, but in any case it is wonderfully atmospheric. The second movement um, has a completely different contrasting mood and color, D minor, Beethoven's favorite device of long chords in the right hand, juxtaposed with a kind of implacable clock. Maybe pizzicati in the celli basses, or well, bassoon perhaps is not quite the case, but something very strict and severe. The common thing between the two movements is the sense of pulse. Uh, the same thing where we had before. 
for this, you still have a very strict and clear but where in the first movement I feel this is to be a sign of life. Here for me this movement is much more introvert and introspective. It is very personal as if talking about a single life and its fragility as we'll see in the end rather than about life in general. The pulsation comes also in the second part of the theme. This time not with nice and soft harmony, but harmony is quite sharp and strong. Just a single voice remaining, and then the final part of the melody in very empty octaves. Also, the left hand, this is a very empty, hollow sound. Czerny, um, one of uh, Beethoven's greatest students and who also wrote a lot about of Beethoven, he said that Beethoven loved this movement and played it very often and felt that it was like a ballad from times past or a story, a simple story, he said, and that it should be interpreted in the same vein. I think, of course, sincere simplicity is definitely the, the character. It doesn't require a lot of extra emotion added from the interpreter because there is some, there's something very powerful in this reserved severeness. As if the emotion is there, we feel it, but it is, until the very end, it is held quite tightly in check. The middle section gives us a little bit of relief. a little bit more merry, but it is somewhat short-lived. Just 16 bars are allocated for the merrymaking. And we go back to um, the beautiful theme of the beginning. This time, um, when it's repeated, in the beginning, uh, the two halves of the theme are, are, are repeated exactly as they are. So this time, the second time is a variation. same thing with the second half um, of the melody, reaching a quite intense personal expression. Especially here. harsh and painful dissonances. And then the coda or an epilogue, like the final part of the story, first without pulsation at all. Then like a, almost like a funeral march. dramaturgical move, Beethoven takes this music and 
transports it to minor. I also find these scores quite a funeral in, in, in character. full personal outburst and then almost resigned pianissimo but then despite the resignation there is a crescendo to a sforzando like a final crying out and as i mentioned Perhaps the story, uh, or at least this is the way I interpret it, is that this movement is about a single life and in the end um, it talks about the end of that life and its fragility. A powerful emotional core to the sonata. But then all this color, all these shadows are immediately faced by the scherzo. It starts with a um, quadruple call of horns. Or you could imagine maybe two pairs, one on one side of the stage, another on the other side. And then the answering uh, motif is all nervous, excited energy. Here. And the entire scherzo is built from this. He uses this idea and then augments it in a textural crescendo. So first time it's one note, second time is one note, then third time is uh, thirds, the fourth time is sixth, and then the final come, the final time it comes, excuse me, it is in fortissimo triads. So there's a kind of build up throughout the, uh, the scherzo itself. trio, I'm going first to play just the melody for you. You might have found it a little bit monotonous, I would guess, but the trick is that the harmonies in the left hand are always different. So first time, and second time, first it goes to a minor, then to a major key, then the next time starts from the major, but then goes to minor. The fifth time there's a build up and a descent. So, here at least there's a little bit of variation of going down and going up. In the first sketches, it was all just the one of the motifs repeated eight times, but then he must have realized that that would be too much even with different harmonies, and he added the second very close but still slightly different motif, and then he alternated between the two, adding the harmonies, the different harmonies, to give um, a lot of color and interest to the trio. In the finale, we go back to our pastoral bass. tempo is very relaxed, it's allegro ma non troppo, so allegro but fast but not too much. It is very grounded because of the bass and also because of the very simple harmonies. The next passage is effectively the harmonic progression of Pachelbel's Canon. And 
this harmonic simplicity lends it such an air of stability and calmness, which we don't usually associate with Beethoven. Um, but here he seems to enjoy it very much. Also, the, the second theme is um, all about triads and inversions. But it had to be Beethoven to make triads sound so magical like bells in the distant air. An interesting element which he adds here is polyphony. So he starts with one voice, then he adds a second voice, and then a third voice. This idea of polyphonic writing is something which he plans here, and he will develop very soon in the second episode. Um, just before we go back to the refrain, there's a little bit of something more powerful. Something a little bit more muscular, I would say. So, um, a, a, a side of nature which perhaps we've not seen so far, something a little bit more... Um, yeah, I'd say muscular is the right word. But then, from here, he goes back to, to the melody. Yeah? But then in the second episode, as I mentioned, he will develop this idea of polyphony. And to contrast all the simple and diatonic harmonies and triads which he's written so far, he will give us a very dense polyphonic texture. connected to another. And this is not, not just in piano, but then we have a build-up towards something truly dramatic. Or... And fortissimo. drama that we only had in the development of the first movement and perhaps here it is even more powerful than in the first movement then he follows with a with a strong fortissimo passage for quite a few bars <laughs> even larger gap between the hands for more space Consistent fortissimo sforzandi. And having reached that point, it all goes back. It is as if it is impossible to escape this rocking lullaby of the of the refrain. And Finally, after the third episode, we have a coda. The coda first starts once again from this rocking motion. And then soon there is a build-up. The uh, alto voice is chromatic. building up the tension and the expectation. Then going into hemiolas. Expectation. And finally, the coda is the only true virtuosic part of the sonata, and it is extremely difficult and finger-breaking. The left hand has to play, so first of all, it is Pio Allegro quasi presto, so faster, almost presto. The left hand, instead of these very comfortable, 
as to play the same thing but much faster in octave staccato. And, and above that we have a really virtuosic right hand line. So together. It goes on and it builds on and on and on, many times repeating the same part. And again. And again. And finally, the final burst. So here Beethoven shows us also the Bacchic part of nature, something which he has not yet shown us in the sonata. This ending is, is, is interesting. It is a lot softer than getting to the bass note instead of finishing on the third. But even so, despite this softening, this burst of light in D major and this virtuoso ending ends the sonata on a real high note.